Tanmay Shah, he heads the innovations at Imaginarium. Imaginarium, it's the it's a it's India's leading 3D printing and advanced manufacturing company. His work allows him to explore the emerging applications that lie at the intersection of design, manufacturing, and tech. He is ever willing to talk about patterns, signals, and connectedness of everything. Over to you, Tanmay. Thank you so much, Malay. Can you guys hear me well? Yeah, uh, yes. it's a black screen. Yeah, we can see. You can see and hear me, right? Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, and uh, thank you, Dr. Biju, for your session. It was wonderful. I was making notes myself. Um, so, I'll try and keep this brief. it's uh, let me quickly set the context okay so this this particular uh, topic is very close to my heart the digital designer toolkit uh, primarily because one i do not come from a, a background of being trained in design in any way but my work has put me face to face with a lot of practitioners experts and newcomers uh, and through those experiences at imaginarium we have developed a particular point of view which i'll be presenting to you mind you this is this might be linked to say a few particular domains or segments but it is not meant to be specific it's a very general broad based idea open for debate of all kinds so first of all for those who don't know imaginarium we are very close to the iit bombay campus we're in andheri east imaginarium is a is a company that started on the foundation of bringing 3d printing and making it accessible to any creative and engineering background guy a designer or a scientist anyone who needed access to that cutting edge technology and we started more than a decade ago and today this place like the name suggests is a place where you come and bring your idea and we hope to do whatever it takes to help you take that idea in a physical form out of here so it requires access to design it access uh, requires access to all kinds of engineers experts from various domains but the ecosystem is what is critical so imaginarium is kind of in that space this is what the office looks like it's a, a it's a very fun place many many a times i have brought even friends and family just for a visit because it sets your mind kind of racing uh, everyone who's come has said that we never knew something like this existed so close to us or it could even be possible so while today is not a in depth session on 3d printing i'm pretty sure you heard about it read about the futuristic applications but on the back of the work we are doing at imaginarium we've built like i mentioned a nice ecosystem that speaks to various experts so the company is divided into a few uh, verticals or business units each specializing in a particular type of manufacturing and design so for example i won't take too much time here but imaginarium precious goes deep into innovating in the field of jewelry and art and sculpture design and manufacturing imaginarium rapid is hardcore product design engineering etc imaginarium life is biomedical applications and everything to do with saving lives through uh, customization and personalization so on and so forth so that's the kind of ecosystem and what i've been doing over the last 5 6 years almost now is finding out what next what next as technology evolves and more and more people adapt there is always room for pushing the boundary and therefore what i was tasked with was to find out okay the running business will now just have to scale up but what's coming next what are the trends in the market and here is an example so the the lockdown has been one of the most enriching experiences for me personally because on the very day that the lockdown was announced a few of us 
huddled together got onto a zoom call like this and we realized the dire need to find our response to this emergency this pandemic how could we help what could we do because all through the last decade we've been kind of promising pitching communicating to the world that technologies like additive manufacturing or 3d printing are going to be able to make products on demand right where you need them when you need them and what better time to put that promise to test than this pandemic so we kind of made a immediate shortlist of products we realized that this is what we might need etc etc et and in a week trust me we could go from an idea to a product that was that had gone through three iterations and was now ready for mass manufacturing the face shield that you see on the screen here is something that was that 7 to 10 day exercise that happened and personally i learned the entire journey of product development and scale up but these are the kinds of projects that keep us ticking on a daily basis when business as usual is ripe we are helping companies and individuals prototype uh, test out their ideas anything from a car component a new car that's being designed to a medical device to a new design for uh, fine jewelry these are the kinds of projects that keep running around and every once in a while we get introduced to really interesting things like making a prosthetic limb for a wild animal or uh, working on a film project because it requires futuristic props so it's this amalgamation of very diverse ideas under one roof that uh, that is my context and my background so having said that what is it that has that has been playing on my mind right so we keep talking about the fact that the world is changing access is becoming easy access to anything what changes when everything changes is there something that remains constant well very very open ended but one particular way of looking at it uh in the last 2 to 3 years there's been a lot of talk about this term called millennials be it in the field of luxury product design where everyone is asking how can we cater to this uh, millennial generation they have disposable income and they have this and that or be it in the world of technology where the discussions are about how can we design products and services that are apt for digital natives and millennials it's quite an abused word over abused word but the terms that get associated with a millennial are typically one that they are hyper connected because of social media they are up to speed with anything that's happening even halfway across the world and when that happens they also get exposed to way more in terms of products trends tastes aesthetics and therefore naturally they crave for uniqueness differentiation and to stand out and that's when brands and companies start their thinking saying that how can we cater to millennials by offering them something unique something where they can stand out my argument here is that ask yourself that is this only a trend or a trait of somebody who's say 25 years old right now i don't think so i believe that human beings at their core across time have had a deep desire to self express to show the world who they truly are and kind of stand out from their neighbor while still fitting in like it's the paradox that you want to stand out and still be part of a group and therefore this image that i've put on the screen it's actually showing the diversity of self expression from almost 150 years ago it came up because of this raging debate especially in the circles of uh, uh, 
as I mentioned, luxury design, where the assumptions of the past were that you make a beautiful product and consumers will come. And the new age audience is not like that. You give them something that has a part of them in the product, that's what will connect to them. Uh, but I don't think so. I believe that 150 years ago, people found the easiest means that they had to still stand out and self-express. It's just that we did not have the means to back it up when it came to designing products that could be individually customized or personalized. So the need for standing out kind of universal. And when I get to that fact, I think what's changing now is that the world is getting highly democratized. And the way in which I'm using that word is in terms of access. Like I briefly mentioned earlier, 50 years back, you could have somebody from say a village in India who could have had an excuse saying that if only I had access to good education, I could have made it big and been successful. So here we have a reference back to the first session that somebody saying that I have the aptitude, but if only I had the opportunity or access. Today, that excuse is pretty much eliminated when you talk about the online education and courseware that is accessible to anyone. It, it costs almost nothing uh, with the data rates in India, etc. But education and access to it is no longer an excuse for you to rise up. Similarly, you could have had an excuse a few years back saying, I've made a fantastic product, uh, but unfortunately, I have no access to distribute it. If only this could reach uh, people living in a country outside where I am, this is a brilliant product, but I'm not going to be successful. I don't have access to distribution. That's gone away. You can set up a store in a matter of minutes and uh, invite customers from across the world. No excuses. Similarly, somebody who's highly talented could have said, if only my dance was dancing skills were spotted by this television channel, I could have made it big. Today, if you have talent, you have the platform like YouTube, like TikTok, like Instagram or whatever new tools come up. But uh, there are more than a few examples of people who have been discovered and made it big through such democratized platforms for talent discovery. And I can go on and on and on. But in this, in this line, what what was missing up until now was this was the last frontier not yet democratized it was basically the ability to manufacture a finished product because when you think about it manufacturing or making something is a very scary intimidating process as soon as you think about dealing with a factory or even trying to know where something is make, made I think we all kind of our eyes glaze over and uh, that idea that we might have just had or a sketch we would have just made, we kind of kill the idea right there, no matter how crazy it is or interesting it is. It's because this entire uh, universe of manufacturing is based on how much capital you have, how much knowledge and talent that you have access to and how big you are. So when you have a precondition of scale, it kills out a lot of small time players and individuals. But that's the part that is changing. The ability to take an idea and make it a finished product that reaches the end consumer that it is designed for, that entire life cycle has been transformed in the last few years because of technology. And that brings us to the heart of what I'd like to speak about, which is, I'd like to call it the digital designers toolkit. Now we can debate on who is a designer, what does she do and 
what exactly constitutes the practice of design but that's for a later date for now all we are talking about is anyone involved in the process of creating something new that is designed for an audience could be a product a service a space or an experience any of these it requires a certain understanding and a few skill sets and take the example of the idc there will be a fixed program that you go through and you emerge as a say a product designer it is to this audience that my i would kind of urge that why don't you look at your current toolkit and assess how up to speed is it with the changing times so this toolkit that you see on your screen is an add on not a substitute but an add on to everything that you have up until now learned the tools that we will go through in a little detail are basically the process of design thinking but with the booster shot of digital technologies so we'll briefly look at one how can we involve the consumer and the user into the process of making the product from there we argue the fact that if if you are making something that is so unique and personalized then i need the buy in or the approval of my customer before i even make it if that's the case what do i show them before it's manufactured then it comes to the fact that how do we make something in a single quantity because the very basis of our multiple industrial revolutions has been mass manufacturing and economies of scale from there we talk about how can we have a closed loop system where i've put something out in the world what feedback can make my next iteration better and the last tool will be how do we put it all together in absolutely novel ways of storytelling so let's jump right back in and let's talk about this new consumer like i mentioned this new consumer is not defined by age but rather defined by their demands and their expectation and if you have say a 60 year old uh, grandfather who wants and is demanding a perfectly fitting shoe that shoe might have a left and right uh, pair which is different size because that's what the dimensions of this grandfather are in the earlier days we had to find a compromise or we had to fit into the nearest available shoe size and therefore the onus was on the user to adjust but now if we for a moment flip our mindset the old notion was that a designer is the creator of end products which after the process of creation is over are put out into the market to be bought when you flip that 180 degrees on its head my new argument is that can a designer think of herself or himself as the creator of a toolkit that another user can play with just like you're playing with building blocks and make the product that they want and they like when we come to that i think the first discussion whichever field you come from should be that how can i involve that end user into the very beginning of my design phase so one is understanding their needs okay that can be done two is getting access to that data or so for example if it's a shoe how do i get the exact specifications or the dimensions of that shoe or size of their foot we have access to technologies like 3d scanning the next generation of uh, iphones will be inbuilt with 3d scanners and there are a few phones that already have it what i'm trying to say is this is not rocket science anymore it's as easy as taking one photo and sending it over whatsapp so keeping that in mind that you will be able to access extremely detailed user centric data 
another image on your top left is that of a something called a photogrammetry booth it's basically an array of cameras all of them take a photo at the same instant and you can create a 3d model out of it so imagine garments that are perfectly tailored anything that you wear on the right side you're seeing an image of generative design even the, the fundamental principle behind generative design is that you co-create along with the power of computers and algorithms whereby the onus of the final product is not on the designer rather the setting up of constraints is the role of the designer the computer does the rest it does what it is good at coming up with a million possibilities cutting down what is not falling into your constraints and giving you those last three or four options so that you can have a more intelligent design again these are topics to be spent over a day but the first tool is how do you co-create with your end consumer now when that is your intent that i want to make a very personal product like i mentioned you cannot expect that customer or the user to be able to have the same imagination as you have you might be talking a certain language they might be interpreting something not happening how can you help them visualize exactly what's being created without having to manufacture it because then it gets unaffordable this is where the world already has access to cutting edge visualization technologies well we've all seen some animated movies where we can't tell the difference is it real life or uh, computer generated imagery that same set of technologies has now been adapted and evolved into product visualizations especially in a field like the products you see on the screen these might cost lakhs of rupees and the customer you are dealing with might be so finicky because they are paying a bomb that they will want changes each one of these images on the screen is a photorealistic visualization and it has reached a stage where visualizations are as simple as a few clicks if you have the right workflow of course but this is jewelry but imagine if you take this to the level of furniture in your house or you take it to the next car that you want to be buying it is now possible to visualize and therefore that set of tools and technologies must also be part of each one of your toolkits going ahead where are we in the story we've got the customer she is part of the design process we know everything about her unique desires tastes and preferences and we've been able to show versions of the end product which then assume one of the designs has been locked in that okay here's what i want how do you take it to physical reality the last several centuries have been about optimizing and making production technologies highly efficient as well as cost effective to make multiples of one design that's why we kind of have this whole world where there is a small medium large and we have to go and find the nearest match and increasingly in the olden days what was considered artisanal and craftsman which was the norm today has become kind of a luxury that oh i'm making one special eyewear frame of uh, spectacles for you but that's not the case uh, that need not be the case let me put it that way because now that final design that's locked in can be as personal as you want for all we know it might have the signature of the user or the fingerprint of the user as part of the design and still be able to manufacture it within the same cost and the same timelines as any other product yes so i'm talking about this family of technologies known as 3d printing or 
additive manufacturing or in a more broader way digital fabrication this is basically the realm and i'm sure most of you are uh, aware of it the realm of production processes where instead of starting with say a block of material and removing what you don't want by means of drilling cutting etc you are actually starting with nothing and adding material only where required layer upon layer upon layer which is why it's called additive manufacturing that's it that's the fundamental principle that if from a 3d digital design you can recreate a physical product additively then your 3d then that's called 3d printing the fun begins when you explore the materials that are now possible and the various complexities that are now granted when using a 3d printer even 5 to 7 years back i would have been skeptical of what's possible on a printer because it was mainly a tool for prototyping and that's it we still had to rely on a uh, hundred other technologies to come together and mass manufacture something but now 3d printers have reached a stage where on your screen on the left is a farm of desktop 3d printers that are making nasal swabs for testing covid and that was the quickest response that anyone could do when the world was had started facing this pandemic and now there are clusters of these 3d printers around the world that are supporting the local community doing what we call distributed manufacturing because you don't need access to a centralized country or a place where all your manufacturing happens low cost but that's just not all on the right you see a variety of other products um if i put it in a very brief manner 3d printing now eliminates the need for upfront cost which is kind of the basic prerequisite for mass manufacturing because when you make a mold or you make a tool you spend a few lakh or a few crores and then you're forced to sell a million pieces of that product before you even start earning back a 3d printer does not require that mold or that tool so number one you can make one piece at a time number two it allows you geometries that were impossible up until now because say for example a cnc machine cannot make a part that has a ball inside a ball inside a ball because it, the machine just cannot reach there a 3d printer on the other hand it does not care you can make really really complex designs which leads us to the third benefit of absolute personalization because if every product you make can be different and in any shape then you can make products that are extremely unique and for the end user and that's why the whole realm of product design has been revolutionized on the screen you see just a few examples of products that are being put into end use by various uh, startups and companies so what i'm trying to say here is that the design that you made and showed to your end customer can now be made in a single in a single unit with a plethora of materials and processes going into it a little segue into this that if everything that we discussed till now was and is possible digitally then imaginarium kind of questioned the fact that why does access to all of this still have to remain old school because for many years our clients used to walk in through our doors take a, a cd or a pen drive containing their design and then give give it to us and explain the project that's how you typically work with a factory uh but we realized that that's not needed anymore so a few years back we developed what is called the imaginarium online factory which essentially makes the entire plethora of manufacturing technology accessible through an online portal so it's literally a factory in the cloud and if you go back to my first point that typically 
manufacturing something has been an intimidating process even the fact that going to a factory and telling them was scary that bit gets solved uh, to a great extent when we can imagine so many specialized online factories that cater to various industries so this is something that we've put out we've got as of now two different online factories one which caters to engineers and scientists and the other that caters to jewelry designers and manufacturers but the idea is that you no longer need that physical connectivity to start manufacturing so now we have that product and it's given to this customer how do we know how well we did was it worth it or would it have just been better to give them one of those off the shelf products well this is where what i'm about to say is not new but is it part of your toolkit that's where it might be new so in in design school as i learned a large part of the training is about developing empathy be it through talking to your prospective customers understanding their behavior observing it immersing yourself in that environment or doing a scientific study so you have anthropology you have ethnography and you have research well that is extremely important and i do not undermine that but what if you can add to that the whole chunk of somebody's time and energy that is being spent online the entire presence of users which is digital reveals a lot about their likes and dislikes and we all know that of course but how how much are we plugging it into the process of product design so basically the left the heart is that one to one emotional connect or empathy that is important and on the right we add to that the digital footprint of our customers together it adds to what i call computer aided empathy it allows you to know your customer in ways that were up until now impossible it's actually the merging of micro data with macro data big data small data all of that coming together and relieving the designer from a lot of the stress of shooting in the dark making assumptions about that customer but why i put it at this stage in your toolkit is because even after you have delivered one product to that one customer the story doesn't end it is in fact at this point that you start asking and discussing how did that product do uh, if it's if it's a piece of jewelry that we are taking the example of did they share it online did they talk about it with their friends how are they commenting on it what are the others saying when this photo was shared on instagram and how well can you take those insights and quickly iterate just as quickly as we can iterate a website or an app today and send across uh, an update can you do that to physical products well maybe yes we have to come up with ways for that so this is the key point on this slide that as a designer it is imperative that you close the loop and quickly iterate even though you might be working on a physical product but all of this doesn't matter if you don't put it all together a lot of the times the the department for creating the product is divorced from the department that decides how to sell it be it merchandising or be it uh, uh, marketing there's kind of in two different universes but that's not going to work anymore you go to any current business that is that has a brick and mortar store and you talk to the owner of that store you're going to hear the word experience you're going to hear the word storytelling you're going to hear the words that are connected 
to not selling a product but staging an experience so the challenge that these owners are facing is how do i even get somebody to walk in through these doors let alone buy something because nobody is coming to a store and then deciding what to buy these days they have made their decision long long back when they were browsing and they saw a friend wearing a pair of sneakers they have decided they want it all they need to do now is find the way to pay for it and get it delivered so storytelling is a very very vast field but in the context that i'm speaking of it's about putting all the previous steps together and giving this toolkit that you've designed or the building blocks that you have kind of curated and opening them up to your customer and mind you it's easier said than done because a lay person a lay user a common man is paralyzed by too much choice if you are thinking that they can kind of get into your wavelength and fine tune every little aspect of this product well that's a very tiny fraction of customers these are your power users but for the rest of the world if you give something that looks so scary and intimidating you've lost them technology is going to give you many many options but what you cut out is what defines you as the designer so this is one example of shoes that are completely customizable these are tailor store is a, a really interesting website but again i feel that there are too many options here at imaginarium we got the opportunity to make or redefine the way uh, a certain category of products was being sold basically we partnered with raymond the guys who have almost a thousand stores in india and they are into menswear and they realized that okay while somebody comes in to buy say a a customized tailored suit for themselves for the wedding they are naturally going to require accessories to go with it and their current business model or the model at that time was of physical stock and inventory in each of those thousand stores no store knew what's happening in the other they couldn't see the designs that were available elsewhere they were kind of restricted to sell what is available physically right now and what we told them was this exact same story that the whole world is changing and why don't you leverage new age technologies because it's the win win for both for raymond or let's start with the customer for the customer imagine being able to see a plethora of designs as many as they want and still be able to personalize it each piece to their liking maybe they are, they add their name to it or they add a signature to it and in doing so they feel so connected and so involved in the product that they feel that it's their creation and when you when you start believing something is your creation you tend to forgive a lot of flaws and you overvalue the the whole piece and that answers the biggest question for companies and brands today is that how do i charge a premium and not become a commodity that's the biggest question plaguing everyone they're like i can't afford to have a thousand stores i can't afford to have the most the largest marketing budget how do i get a customer to value the product for something that is above the cost of materials that went into it this is one very interesting way that if the customer feels they have designed the product they're not going to buy it cheap and we've kind of experienced it so that was personalization for the customer a premium for raymond and most importantly the elimination of physical inventory that is a big 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 burden for any business all of this was made on demand after the customer designed it and paid for it so what we created was this entire technology product and manufacturing workflow where in a raymond store you get an ipad you browse through this 
catalog of designs and each piece can be personalized in some dimension or the other i won't go too deep into that so you can from the base level of changing the color to adding your thumbprint to it and so much more and every week we could kind of tweak the product assortment because we are now running an ab test which is uh, which is basically so familiar in the world of software and web design and applying it to physical products we're testing different products tweaking them it costs us nothing basically and with all of that data we're delivering a product that's still in their expected timelines and price points so that was one example another one is this using uh, really cutting edge image processing augmented reality etc you're changing an entire business model something that went from expecting a physical presence of a customer to going into their houses pretty much like the flipped classroom this is a flipped retail store where the store comes to you and going ahead in the future i'm pretty sure that mixed reality augmented reality virtual reality whatever you call it that's going to play a huge role in transforming some business models that didn't even exist till today so we can that we can discuss about that later on but this is a small glimpse and i can pretty much stop here to have discussions none of what i've said is new but the way it comes together is what excites me so yeah what do you guys think uh, yeah uh thanks yeah thanks tanmay for the detailed uh Talk. Yeah. Um, so I, now the I I open the forum for discussion. So there are any yeah. questions? I have a question, Tanmay. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. I mean, mine is not a question, but I uh, I'm just uh, intrigued and uh, really interested about one particular uh, scope, maybe. uh do you envision that maybe in 5 years or 10 uh, years down the line people would like to own a 3d printer like a commodity in their home where they can just uh then after that how i envision that uh it will be like uh, you just go to a particular website of some brands so it can be a household product it can be a water bottle uh i don't know pen pencil anything you just go to the website download the design paper the design and they have the 3d printer at your home and you print it essentially so do you envision that happening in a time soon where the ownership of a 3d uh, 3d printer is something like every people would like to have i mean how do you see the scenario changing sure sure i if you ask me personally i do not subscribe to that vision and what you're okay. asking is has been a long standing promise of 3d printing since 10 15 years now uh, but i'll tell you why i don't believe in it one mm -hmm. because no single printer serves all requirements it is actually equivalent to a factory where if you see a cnc machine and then you see a lathe and then you see a wire cutter there are a lot of things that go behind making a finished product number one mm -hmm. and even within 3d printing there is such a vast variety of requirements of materials etc uh, so on a fundamental level i even if we assume that a one size fits all printer is is invented i still don't believe that human beings want to make the product as much as have access to something that they create and when you talk about that my bet is on a future where there might be an app store for physical products and then you go and pick it up from your neighborhood corner xerox shop because that xerox shop is much more suited to have like a nice small little uh, compact manufacturing workflow if you've broken a door handle you don't want the mess uh, or the headache of manufacturing it as much as you want a say in that new design you want it in your taste and color and texture and there will be an app store for all kinds of products but uh, 
I'm not betting on a printer being part of every home. Okay, thanks. Um, while we're taking question, this is just one more example yeah. uh, of how you can use fundamental basic technologies and create a story and a narrative that is opened up for transformation by our customer. So this is a parametric design and I can wrap a nice story around it saying that here's a ring that represents or basically you take the metaphor of throwing a, a pebble in a still lake and the ripples that are generated and I can go a step further and kind of link it to love and something like that. But what I'm trying to do is tell the customer that every throw of that pebble is unique. And why don't you create your own ripples? And then on the right, you're seeing kind of the under the hood, the parameters that can transform this design, create a million variations. And if as a designer, somebody creatively links these parameters to the story that I just said and makes it available on while browsing Instagram. That kind of narrative and story is pretty compelling. Uh, it needs a lot of work, of course, but it's now possible. That's what I'm trying to show you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anmay. I had a, I had a question. I mean, so, like you said, uh, I mean, it was evident in the in two or three of the examples that you spoke about. Uh, the Raymond one, the recent one about uh, having an app store for products. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, am I audible, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, my uh, question is about, you started the talk with democratizing manufacturing, right? Democratizing the ability of ideas to come to life. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, okay. So that democratization democratization has transformed into decentralization in the end. I mean, through the examples, like like you said, you took an example of Xerox shop. Uh, mm -hmm. So in my head, democratization is some way related to decentralization, and this is where the this is the way forward. Uh, the capitalist notion of uh, products is going ahead. Like if decentralize everything. Like we have Uber instead of taxis, instead of unions and so forth. Like we have Tinder in, instead of good old long time romance and so forth. Sorry. So, uh, so my question is, is decentralization the only way of deep democratization in this context? Great question. That's actually, yeah. So I'm, uh, it sets me thinking, but the only difference or a big difference here is the there is still the prerequisite of capital equipment, machinery, people, skill, labor, etc. Because that is not going anywhere. One of the other philosophies, if I may just little lengthen the answer that I'm giving. One of the other philosophies we've got is that getting too enamored and falling in love with technology is a recipe for disaster. It is actually at the intersection of cutting edge tech with good old craftsmanship, skilled design, etc., at the intersection where magic happens, and we are not we are not uh, evangelizing or uh, vouching for substituting the old way of making, in as much as saying you can now unlock way more opportunities. Let me give you a small example. A person who requires a prosthetic limb earlier had very, very few options. Step one, they had to even first live in an area where there is somebody who, a doctor and a manufacturer who sells the prosthetic limbs. After all of that, the affordability and all of those questions came later. With all the tools that I just mentioned in my talk, there are now absolutely new business models where a community, a village, town, anyone, can have a small centralized printing facility and everything else can be done remotely. For example, a few dimensions are taken or a few measurements of somebody's limb are taken and sent as an email to 
from Bombay to New York. In New York, a designer can customize an existing prosthetic limb design, make it suitable for this patient, and email the 3D design to the local printing center. That print center obviously follows a SOP, prints it out, and a doctor oversees even remotely the correct fitment of that prosthetic limb. And this is a reality. I'm not making this up. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of business model, uh, I'm still thinking if it falls in the centralized old way of capitalism, or is it? Does it? Does it get classified as uh, the Uber and the Ola model? What do you think? I don't so have I, an answer, but what do you think? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, so that exam, so that example. Uh, although, so it, it revolves around the idea of uh, choices, or like I think the it is it is gift wrapped in the form of let's say I am giving you more and more choices, but I will. Um, still control majority part of it like it the, the, there is a notion so so, uh, so the same thing might happen at the raymond store that we in, envisioned as well let's say um, i i get the i get to choose what kind of uh, uh, the what do you say um, the buttons i want let's say for example what kind of buttons i want on my shirt um, hmm. i get that level of customizability but in the end, uh, because of that customizability, I, I'll, although the, like you said, the, the aspect, psychological aspect that I, I'll be overwhelmed by the choices offered and so forth, uh, that is true, but I will purchase more because the, I, I will purchase the, what do you say, um, the buttons more. I, I, so with the notion of customizable buttons, there also comes the notion of replaceable buttons so i i will have the let's say for example i'll have the same same shirt but i can have i can have different sets of buttons so basically we are still yes. bifurcating the products atomizing the products like atomizing the products into smaller and smaller bits until we can combine everything else so that is a cool idea i think uh, the main now the question becomes um, what what should one design like you said in your life last or last two second slide you you wrote that designer as a tool maker uh, but I, uh, I i i i also wish to explore the idea of tool maker or designer as a tool maker let's say a uh, designer can be a tool maker as well as um i don't know how do i expand it because i think the this uh, that notion of designer as a tool maker is kind of limiting in a way. I mean, it seems limiting. Absolutely. No, no, I, I, I would happily agree to that uh, point you make and kind of add that maybe that's not the only way of looking at it, but it's one of the interesting ways to relieve old stresses and allow for new opportunities. By, by that, let me expand that. When as an individual, the lone designer or the lone inventor sitting in a room, that concept and coming out with a Eureka moment, that puts a lot of burden in today's day and age on that one person. When I flip that and say that the designer is a maker of those building blocks, then you kind of keep all the doors open and say that, okay, this designer is not a know-it-all, nor is the customer the know-it-all. There is a path in the middle where we meet and co-create. That's the hmm. only uh, suggestion that I'm, I'm trying to make. Right, right. So, makes sense. Uh, uh, so, I'll open up. So, anyone wants to join to the discussion or add a new question, new point of discussion, please go ahead. All right. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tanmay and Dr. Briju both for sparing their time and speaking with us, making it super interesting slides and giving super interesting thought-provoking questions and content. Uh, 
i hope uh, you had you also had a good time speaking to us and uh, join us for our future meets as well i'll absolutely thank, uh, amit deepak and uh, divya for organizing this and rest thanks all of our, all of the audience to join us it was very kind of you to spare some time on weekend thank you pleasure let's meet next talk thank you yeah thank you tanmay thank you dr brijo thank you thank you yeah